Hey everybody, this is Christian Buckley with another MVP Buzz Chat, and I'm talking today with Susie. Hello. Hi, Christian. Thank you for having me today. It's great to have you. I was just talking, as we were talking before we started recording, I know a couple of folks from your team, but like this is the first time, I think this is the first time we've ever met. I don't know, I've done so many different events over the years. Maybe we crossed paths at one it point. It is. We're like ships in the night. <laughs> But uh, so lots of events together, but not directly. Uh, well, that's the thing you get, especially when I've, uh, I think the last event I was in Europe, not I think the last event I attended was in Prague in December 2019 for ESPC. Wow. So that was the last time that I was across the pond and yeah. visiting, but I'll be back out in June. I'm very excited yeah. to get over to London for Commsverse. Oh, fantastic. Like, stuff. Yeah, the, last course, time I was, the last time I was stateside was... 2019 Ignite, because we were speaking, myself, Paul, and Wes, so Paul Schaefer and Wes Hackett, who are both in my team, um, uh, and we all had sessions at, at, at Ignite, so I think now with uh, the Microsoft conferences all being online, um, every everybody I talk to says the same thing, I was last there in 2019. Yeah. We're just, we just need to talk about it, like it was the Thanos blip, it was the snap of the fingers, and we're, we're back now, it's five years later. <laughs> But uh, hey, so folks that don't know who you are, who are you, where yeah. are you, and what do you do? Yeah. So my name's uh, Susie Dean. I'm the chief, chief executive uh, and owner of Addin365, which is Microsoft Charter Partner based out of the UK. Um, we specialize in uh, really the end user services in Microsoft 365. So Teams, SharePoint, Power Platform, um, we have products and services that help organizations to get the best out of those capabilities. Well, that's a big space. And it's, uh, yeah. you know, with Microsoft focusing so much, I, I find myself having this conversation with partners all the time because I, I run the global alliances for Microsoft and AppPoint. And I, as we onboard partners that are mostly MSPs and we kind of talk about, you know, what, what do we need to know in working with Microsoft? Let me ask you that question. What do partners need to know about working with Microsoft? Like, how how do you keep up with the rapid pace that things are coming out? Yeah, and um, we're we're lucky. We've got three Microsoft MVPs: myself, Paul, and Wes, running Addin three six five. So we work really closely with Microsoft product groups to understand what's Microsoft's trajectory for a service, and where do we think there are gaps? So where are clients going to need our support? Um, and we develop our products to really plug the gaps in, in what Microsoft provide. Um, and it's a good business model for us because um, products mean we can show clients up front what they're going to get. There's a fixed price point. They get it quickly. Um, uh, and it works well in the current climate where Microsoft um, services and people are in high demand and you can't necessarily get the headcount to do everything bespoke, bespoke, bespoke. So I think it's a win-win in terms of, um, uh, of the model we've come to, but I think for, for an organization or a partner looking to partner with Microsoft, I would say, think about how you're going to understand Microsoft's roadmap well, because whether you are producing products or delivering services, you need to be really aligned to that now. So where do you see the most, um... Uh, you know, opportunities for growth with yeah. within the Microsoft stack today? I mean, what are customers asking the most about? Yeah, it's it's interesting because the, and it's, it's always been like this, but because since 2020, there's been a lot of world action, whether it's COVID or World War, um, you know, that there's, what people are asking for is aligned to global events. So we're seeing huge, uh, increase in in demand around our uh, intranet product. Well, now we call it employee experience. Mm -hmm. um, we have one package in particular that's about brand alignment, and that's off the charts in terms of uh, the the requests and and the number of people wanting to invest in that. Because hybrid work has meant that organisations are thinking about how to keep the emotional connectedness 
between their organization and their employees when their employees might be three, four days at home or even they're still full time at home. So um, I think the, the pandemic now hybrid work has has uh, seen that that accelerate, um, whereas we sort of know that internet products projects traditionally have always bobbed along, haven't they? So um, I don't think that's anything to do with us or Microsoft. I think that's the world dictating dictating that. Um, and similarly, we've seen a big increase in our governance and standardization tools. So we've got a governance tool for teams, um, and then we've got tools for user experience standardization for SharePoint and Teams. And again, we've seen those go uh, off the charts as well, because uh, and, you know, this is very, very recent with the, the, the Ukraine-Russia uh, conflict. Um, we've seen almost all of our clients that have had an operation in Russia and or Ukraine kind of going, we need to pick up this workload elsewhere around the world, or we need to divest that part of the organization. How can we do that really quickly? We need technology tools that are gonna that are gonna support that change. So I think the world has rather than Microsoft Roadmap or things we want to take to market have, have dictated what, what's hot at hot at the moment. I think that the one exception to that is Microsoft's Viva uh, experiences and, and capabilities. I think that's definitely been led by by Microsoft and everybody's talking about it everybody wants to work with it um, we've uh, got a, a set of products coming to market soon um, for the Viva Connections dashboard capability um, and that really delivers against long-term business challenges around poor content findability poor levels of personalization and of course the Viva dashboard delivers personalization it delivers productivity it delivers relevance and you know it, it's there it's very easy to find that content so um we're we're everybody's sort of looking at, at that capability and seeing it as the solution to lots of long-term problems that, that we've all known about in the industry for a long time well that's what's interesting about viva is it's uh it, it's not that it's uh you know groundbreaking per se and uh, there's a lot of interesting things and obviously from a technology standpoint probably the most interesting to a bunch of the you know the nerds that have been involved in sharepoint and teams for you know for many many years is on the uh the topic side of things and yeah. and uh and some of the other products that come out of uh, syntax as sharepoint syntax as well but connections is probably the most robust and probably i think it was the first of the Viva solutions that was available and the most robust and meets that those surface those obvious needs of that personalization of finding the right the findability of information within yeah. the platform. Well, it's, yeah, think... it's uh, the other side of that too is is that it is so much about Viva is Microsoft realizing that uh, the evolution that's happened over the last six seven years of Microsoft realizing we can't just sell licenses. We have to sell it in a way and help customers so they're actually using, consuming the product that we're selling. And so the focus has really shifted towards adoption and engagement, which is great to see. It, it's been completely consistent though, hasn't it? Because if you look at SharePoint, uh, um, my first project was SharePoint 2003. And as you know, you needed a developer to, to update content on a page. And then in 2007, and you know, we had things like the Teller at Red Editor to start being able to put content into pages. And then, you know, 2010, 13 online, it's, got, it's moved more and more towards regular business people being able to produce those experiences. Mm -hmm. All Microsoft have done there is continue that line of thinking correctly uh, and kind of gone, oh, well, what are people trying to do? They're trying to learn. What are people trying to do? Aggregate content. Um, and, and I think those Viva skis are representative of, of that. Um, and, and actually, you know, this is thinking that spans much wider, doesn't it? Because if you think about the Teams apps, it's a similar vein, or Tim's, you know, the Teams industry capabilities. It's Microsoft thinking about the use cases for the technology rather than just the te technology underpinnings. Right. Um, I think you mentioned syntax and topic, you know, topics. And for me, it's, I think the, the, the thing that's interesting um, is that as long as I've worked in the industry, the, the most high value workload for any organization 
has been getting knowledge management right mm. um, and having a way of centralizing that organizational IP. Uh, and what's interesting is that where the technology is very much there today, whether you're thinking about people collaborating and working out loud in teams or having these hubs of know-how content, whether that's around a client or a product or ways of working, um, you know, having syntax topics, aggregating that information, the organizations still really, really struggle with getting their people to produce that content or even dump that content in some scenarios. So it, the technology has very much overtaken um, where businesses are. And I, I don't know what is in the zeitgeist that blocks so many large organizations from biting the bullet and getting these things written down, um, which you know would it would it deliver incredible business value for them, uh, both in the context of a, a great resignation where there is the potential for lots of IP and know how to to, to leave the organization, um, but also just in terms of being more competitive in a global market. Certainly in the UK, we're suffering huge inflation at the moment. Taxes have increased. Uh, there is talk of uh, another recession. Um, but yeah, they, they don't seem to get there. And um, we never see organisations motivate and incentivize their managers to get that information out of their people. So I think whether you're looking at Teams rollouts, um, traditional uh, intranet employee experience projects, or even dynamic CRM projects, um, getting people to actually use, adopt uh, these tools and actually upload that content and have it available to the organization. They, they, it, it's still the big hurdle, I think. Well, hasn't it gotten even harder than that? Because, uh, you know, 25 years ago where most collaboration, certainly when I was, when I got involved in collaboration technology in the mid nineties and started working on my first portal and was chartered yeah. with gathering this information and making it findable. And inside my org, it was document based or spreadsheet mm. based, you know, and, and there was some data that was out there that would integrate in. And of course, um, but we have gotten away from using the documents, documents in the same way. So much of the data that I generate on a daily basis, looking at my own patterns, I'm using lists, I'm in chats, I'm in conversations. It is so much more unstructured than it's ever been before, which makes it even more imperative for organizations to look at these technologies and that can draw in the content from all of these yeah. different signals, decipher it, format that, and present it back in a way yeah. that's consumable. You can't just rely on people to upload the documents and the, the files that are relevant and are tagged correctly and have the right content within it to be able to provide what people need to know about a project at the end of that project. Yeah. You know, it, it's, it's just, it's very different. But it's always been chronically underfunded, hasn't it? I mean, always. You, you've always had knowledge managers who are absolutely people that completely understand they need to gather content on processes, ways of working. And I think that the reason it's generally been underfunded is because the, the work involved in getting it right is cross-departmental, probably spanning multiple countries in, in, in a lot of instances as well. And it, it just feels like too big a thing to get right. But, but the wins are definitely there for, for the organisations that do it. Uh, and we saw that with a lot of organisations we deployed teams very early on with and where, where those organizations had rolled out the full use of the um, team service in terms of channel structures, how to align that to workloads that were going on in their organization. So, uh, you know, WPP is the world's largest media company. We did uh, a lot of work with those, um, uh, those guys through uh, an M&A period, uh, and it, it did really well. And same with a very large pharmaceutical company that we work with as well, same thing. So um, I think, you know, where the effort's there, the big wins can be had, but um, certainly it's not, not, on, not on everybody's to-do list. Yeah. Well, it's, I, I think that it's, well, it's one thing that you, at your earlier point about, you know, even Microsoft and taking the time to focus more on the use cases, what, 
the well the experiences so they you like using that word a lot the employee experiences rather than so we're not so focused on keeping servers up and um, keeping yeah. those services up and running it's a given there the servers are running it's dynamic it's it's in the cloud it's always on it's elastic in its scalability so that as our organization grows we we don't need to think about buying more hardware and adding that in as we did in the on-prem days and you know kind of all those different pieces it allows us that luxury to go in and start looking at those end-to-end -end experiences and saying, okay, where are the gaps here? Where are we losing information? Where do we not have data? Yeah. Where do, or, or just looking at the usage patterns and yeah. recognizing we as an organization, we are more email centric still than others. Yes, we're using Teams. We have SharePoint here, but we're still very Outlook centric. So let's yeah. develop tools and integrations that are nuanced for the, the collaboration style and culture of our yeah. organization, which is more email centric. Yeah. Um, I, yeah. I completely agree with that. And something we do, and we've done it since we started the company in 2015, we start every project with something called success definition, where we're talking to the leaders of the organization, we're not talking to them about tech, we're saying, what's the CEO asked you to do? And we ask the CEO, what's the board asked you to do? And then we say, right, well, you know, the technology you're already invested in can support it in the following ways. And the sorts of goals you're typically hearing from the C-suite are around uh, M&A, increased growth in certain markets, product lines, retaining people you typically hear from head of HR. And so when you, when you approach it from that, what's the business trying to do angle, you can very easily line up behind that. Microsoft's capabilities, I mean, obviously we have our own products that bring those together as well um, and deliver those. And the great thing about that approach is that the business value is felt really, really fast. Whereas if you're sort of looking at it in terms of rolling out a technology or a service capability, you kind of miss the point because how could you ever connect that into the bigger picture? If you haven't started with the bigger picture, you don't understand the bigger picture. Um, so I think having that uh, having that sort of use case approach, you know, you, that, that can be elevated even further in, in the way that in the way that we do so that you, you've really got that strategic underpinning. Um, and of course, from a, from a product and services and a client lifetime, uh, or client, yeah, lifetime value perspective, it's really good as well, because obviously they, they, they see the business value and they want to do more with the stack. They're kind of saying, great. What, now that we've done that, can we do more? Things like topics, things like syntax, you can do that stuff when your content's in, if people are working in the platform properly, um, you know, you've got your communities rolled out in Yammer, all those things can suddenly start to, to sing for you if, if you're treating it in that use case, from that use case angle. So I think Microsoft have really got that right and partners that are approaching it that way are getting it right as well. You know, there's a, uh, it, I've been a long time away from it, so I'll, I'm, I don't remember the exact wording, the phrasing for it, but um, in business school, there's a, there, there's a, I remember having many conversations and uh, breaking out the HP 12C calculators to look at trying to put a number around the cost of lost opportunities. Yeah. So like we, you'll never, it's to, to try and put a number around like a company not doing something, not trying something. I always use that phrasing when I talk about um, what it means. You have 100 people in your organization. And if only 25 of them are actively collaborating together within the tools, yeah. and they could be highly efficient, you could be effective, you could be hitting all your numbers, exceeding your numbers as a company. What would it have been had 50% of the company, 75% been collaborating? How much better would your information be? How much faster would you be time to market with product? Yeah. And, and going and trying to calculate that and show that. It's, yeah. you know, we, it's, it's a given, it's intuitive to, to know that if everyone is collaborating, if we're leveraging more of our collective brain, we're going to get more output and it'll be yeah. better, better quality. Yeah. I mean, it, it, when we when we do these um, sort of new ways of working rollouts, which is exactly that kind of onboarding, how are you doing things as a client team or a product team today? If we lift that, and, and we're not going to redefine your purpose, but if we just use better technologies, what's the ROI to the organization? 
and it's definitely i mean you know between 30, 30 and 50 percent of the organization you you have that maximum value point and then there is a there is a there is a long tail which you know i think it's fine to get the maximum value and, and not necessarily um touch everybody but we we have a similar model to the one you've talked about we look at um cost price and value so the price is the price but the cost is the cost of doing it and also the cost of not doing it to your organization which is your point about the opportunity lost and of course the value is the roi on the activity so the generally the bigger picture um, and that works really well in road mapping with clients which parts of their organization should they be doing these bigger investments in more focus more time more energy um versus versus everybody else i have to say that i think the long-term pain I would love to see resolved is moving finance teams out of Excel and into something better. Um, because I, I think Excel, you could get a Nobel Peace Prize if you move people out of Excel. <laughs> well, the problem is there's Excel, and then there's the fact they all link the Excel sheets. So it's like this lethal game of trying to move right, these things give it out into yep. apps and lists, and you're kind of thinking, oh, my God, if we turn this off or we get rid of this, what's going to fall over in, you know, somewhere else in the organization. But, but I actually don't, I don't think there's a particularly good tool as of yet to, 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 to deal with, with what most finance teams try to do, which is why they're still in Excel. Well, you know, it's why, why, I mean, this is a different line of conversation, but it's why Lotus Notes was so difficult yeah. to get out of organizations was because um, like financial teams and the small database driven applications that be developed on there, yeah. they're so embedded. They've mm -hmm. so abused, gone away from the core function of what it should have been. Yeah. And so they're the slowest adopters of the new technology. And that yeah. just- Yeah, yeah. They they're definitely in the long tail. I think the easier to shift is where you're finding innovation teams using Excel. They're easy to move because it's just like, well, what are you actually trying to do? This isn't a numbers thing, is it? No, no, no. It's just a way of organizing some workloads. Um, so, so they're pretty easy to move away from it. Um, but again, it goes back to that knowledge management, doesn't it? It's either high value information or, or it's not in, in one way or another. Well, you know, for the last 25 years, Excel has remained the number one project management tool out there. I believe that we're slowly getting the loosening that grip on the project management side, just because it's not any single solution. I wish it were planner or project or something. It's not, you know, MS project is one of the, but it's such a, there's so many different project management solutions that are out there, but the Kanban based, the list based, I think are winning people away from using Excel as a project management tool. And maybe that'll help loosen the grip over time. But. You're definitely right about that. And I think that the biggest evidence of it is if you look at um, workplace platforms that are not as good or as well established as Microsoft's, like the Google platform, mm -hmm. um, the add-ins that are very popular there are things like monday.com. And it's effectively the Google version of Planner, isn't it? Except it's third right. party. Uh, and the fact is they haven't, what's popular there isn't an, an alternative version of uh, Excel or, um, or even a traditional project management tool. It's it's that Kanban style of boards, lists, drag, drop. Um, yes, it's it's a it's a funny old world. Yeah. Well, it's well. I know that we're we're out of, out of time here, but you know, Susie, it's been great meeting you. It's a great discussion. I always like to wrap it up by asking the people want to get in touch with you, find you. What are the best ways to reach you? Yeah, addin365.com. Um, we've got a brochure up in the top right hand corner where you can download some of our latest case studies. We do a, a biannual uh, brochure of the different projects and, and work we're doing. So if you're interested in the sorts of things we've talked about with those end user services, get in touch. Wow. Wow.